Okay. Coordinate bonding, coordinate covalent bonding, data bonding, data covalent bonding. These are all names for this type of bonding. And we call it a coordinate because when this bond is formed, one atom provides both the electrons that are needed for a covalent bond. So this is kind of a covalent bond, but in this case, the electrons are not shared equally. Actually, one atom provides both electrons. For dating covalent bonding, what we need is that one atom to have a lone pair of electrons and that entire lone pair would be shared. The second atom to have unfilled orbitals except the lone pair. In other words, an electron deficient compound, all right? So remember, let me just give you a quick review. Electron deficient compounds were the compounds which had some electrons deficient because their octet was non complete. A very good example was boron trifluoride. Since boron only had three atoms in their outermost, three electrons in their outermost shell, they belong to group 13. Even after having three covalent bonds, it only had six electrons and their octets were not complete. We call them electron deficient. So these kind of molecules or these kind of ions or these kind of species are pretty good since they will easily form a coordinate bond. An example of this is ammonium ion, NH4 positive. When this is formed, this is formed when ammonia combines with hydrogen ion, H positive. The hydrogen ion is electron deficient. Before we move with this, let me tell you, a hydrogen atom only has an electron, one electron in its outermost shell. When it loses this electron, it becomes hydrogen positive, which we call a hydrogen ion, right? So this hydrogen ion actually has no electron at all. And since this is the first energy level of the first shell, it can contain a maximum of two electrons. So this is electron deficient. It has space for two electrons in its shell, as I just stated. The nitrogen atom in the ammonia molecule, as we explained yesterday, has a lone pair of electrons. Now this lone pair of electron can be donated to this electron deficient species. What happens, it forms a bond. We show it like this. There are no needs for arrows, but you might see arrows in some books, that's fine. If there are arrows, remember the tail represents the donor. The head represents the scepter. The tail represents the species that has a lone pair. And the head represents a species which is usually electron deficient, right? And you would notice it's a dot cross, dot cross, dot cross. So it's pretty easy to understand that in an overlapping area, if it's a cross cross or a dot dot, that means it's a coordinate covalent one or a data one. So it's pretty easy. But when we draw it, we keep the differences between straight lines and an arrow. Again, the tail represents the atom which had the lone pair, the head represents the species which is electron deficient. The whole thing would have then the plus sign. Since uh, something with neutral or no charge, with no oxidation state, combines with something that has a plus one oxidation state, results in something that has a plus one oxidation state in total, all right? So the charges has to be balanced apart from the fact that they are forming a new bond. Make sense? Sir, I can't hear you. Did you not hear the entire thing? Did you not hear the entire thing or did you lose me at a specific part? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Okay, good. That was a problem at my end. Let's repeat. So I was saying that this is an example of ammonium ion, NH4 positive. And ammonium ion is formed when ammonia, NH3, combines with a hydrogen ion. And I explained that hydrogen only consists of, only consists of one electron in its outermost shell, which when lost is formed the hydrogen ion. And the hydrogen ion has no electrons at all. Now it has no electrons, but remember, since this is the first shell, 
it has the capability for two electrons, which is also mentioned over here. So the hydrogen electron, a hydrogen ion is electron deficit. It has space for two electrons in its shell. The nitrogen atom in the ammonia molecule has a lone pair of electrons like we discussed yesterday. So this entire lone pair would be donated to this electron deficient species, All right? So what happens in this case is that we sometimes draw this arrow, sometimes we don't. In this book, in this book, you don't see this arrow, but in some other books, you might see the arrow. But let me tell you, the tail of the arrow represents the atom with the lone pair. We also call it the donor. The head of the arrow represents the uh, uh, species, which is electron deficient. We call, also call it the acceptor. We draw it like this. In this way, you would easily be able to catch it. In the overlapped area, this is a dot cross, which means it's a covalent bond. Dot cross, covalent bond, dot cross, covalent bond. But a dot dot or a cross cross mean, represents a dative bond. So this one is a dative bond. But when it comes to these lines, this line represents a covalent bond. This one does the same. This one does too. However, uh, this represents the same arrow. Again, the tail of the arrow represents the donor or the one that had the lone pair, and the head of the arrow represents the acceptor, or the one that we have been calling the electron deficient species. Remember, this one had no charge. This one was a compound. It's neutral. This one has a plus one charge. And when both of these are added, we formed a compound with a plus one charge. So remember, we balanced the charges as well. All right? So this is the whole thing. You need to understand a few steps that something with the lone pair donates the entire pair to something that is a species that is electron deficient. And then they form a bond. We call that a dative bond. We're presented with an arrow instead of a straight line. So to keep it differentiated from the covalent bond. And we make sure we sum up the charges in order to keep the whole thing balanced in terms of charges and of atoms, respectively. Make sense? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good, good, great. Moving on. <clears throat> in displayed formula, which show all the atoms and all the bonds, we have detail in IGCSE. Maybe we have talked about Let me explain it again. Displayed formula ka matlab hoga A-levels mein ye wali cheez. Show all the atoms and all the bonds. Aap us mein se kuch bhi skip nahi kar sakte. Sometimes, bache ya karte hain ke wo, let's say, हमने C2H5OH के लिए कहा है कि आप displayed formula शो करें तो बड़ी speed से उन्हें पता होता है इसमें दो carbon है हर carbon के ऊपर कितने hydrogens draw करने हैं वो इसे बड़ी speed से इस तरह से draw कर देते हैं ठीक है which is the right structure by the way मैं उसे इनकार नहीं करता ठीक है and they also know that this OH represents the alcohol group that is right लेकिन इस OH के दरमियान में एक bond था जो कि displayed formula का जब word आएगा तो जरूर show करना है। You're not showing all the atoms and all the bonds. You may be showing all the atoms. They are. You're right with that. But you're not showing all the bonds. So this would be incorrect in A levels. अगर आप displayed formula में all bonds, all atoms show नहीं करते, आपके marks cut जाएंगे। So that was an example. A coordinate bond is represented by an arrow. The head of the arrow points away from the lone pair that forms the bond. And this is another way to remember it. Ke baut achha tarika se yaad rakhne ka. Ke head of the arrow hamesha away point karega lone pair se. Wo lone pair donor ki taraf nahi. Acceptor ki taraf point kar raha honga hamesha. Another example. Ab isme baut saari examples hain joh hum yaha par bata sakte hain. NH4 positive is one example. All right. What you'll see in other examples is H3O positive. H2O can that jab H positive add out hai, H3O positive ban jata hai. Ek aur bahar chhi example jo hai, wo NH3 or BF3 ki hai. Aapko, aapko pata hai ki BF3 ek electron deficient species hai. NH3 ke paas ek lone pair hai. Of course, donation ho sakta hai. Data bond ban sakta hai. So these are some examples that have been used past papers and some um, pretty famous examples as well. Examples you'll find throughout the books. Another molecule that has coordinate bonds is aluminum chloride. At high temperatures, and let me tell you, the formula of aluminum chloride you have been studying is AlCl3. 
At high temperatures, aluminum chloride exists as molecules with the formula AlCl3. This molecule is electron deficient. Don't forget it has an atom from group 13. So it's pretty similar to BF3 in its structure. That's why it's electron deficient. It still needs two electrons to complete the outer shell of aluminum atom. At lower temperatures, two molecules of AlCl3 combine to form a molecule which has with the formula Al2Cl6. Of course, two of them will combine, so there would be two Al and six Cl. These molecules combine because lone pairs of electrons on two of the chlorine atoms form co uh, coordinate bonds with aluminum atoms as shown in the diagram. So there you can see that what would happen, this would be donated to this, this would be donated to this simultaneously. Hence, you would see dot cross, dot cross, dot cross, but dot dot. Again, dot cross, dot cross, dot cross, but dot dot. And a cross cross. That represents the coordinate bonds. So you would see straight lines, three straight lines, telling you they're uh, covalent bonds. And then you would see a data bond here and a data bond here. And they are directed in opposite directions, as I explained over here. Now, they are, there are multiple things confusing with this diagram. First of all, the first thing that my students come up with is that they ask Al. Cl3 metal non metal. Sorry, my bad. Non metal. So, why is this not an ionic compound? And why are we drawing it like a covalent compound? This is a covalent structure. This is the first question I usually face with students. And of course, as I'm saying this, this must be a question in your mind. We have been talking about aluminum as a metal. We aluminum ke uses aluminum ki IGCS in extraction for you. Sub kuch as a metal list has kiya. No doubt that is true. Aluminum is a metal and a light one at that. Okay. Chlorine is a very good non-metal. We also know that. Any compound form basically IGCS in define his definition because it is a metal non-metal combination. Hai. And here, when we talk about this, we draw here covalent bonds and overlap circles. We don't do that. Usually, we do that in this way. 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 We do that in this Plus 3. And CL do that in this Negative. And when these two charges overlap, we form AlCl3, which is an ionic compound. So, we made covalent. So, what I ask my students is to just patiently wait a little. We'll come to this part. We'll discuss uh, surely that's how some of the ionic compounds show a little bit of covalent character and some of the covalent compounds show a little bit of ionic character. All right. Jo students who pass IGCSE se pad rahe hote hain unhe andaza hota hai ki main bonding ke liye pass mat hua bahut sare examples deta hu aur IGCSE mein maine badi bachcho wali example se bonding start ki hoti hai and i am going to quote the same example in order to make myself clear with this i usually come up with examples of two friends uh, and school cafe and i come up with the same example every time let's say two friends go to the same school to the same cafe and they like the same burger they bring some pocket money, let's say uh, that uh, that uh, burger is $2 and both of them bring $1 as pocket money from home. Now, their options are one of them can lose the money, give it to the other one, the other one buys the burger, eats the whole burger without even having a kind look at the other one and afterwards takes a burp in front of him to just tease him that I ate the whole burger. One of the options A or the other options would be, be the exact opposite. The second friend loses the money to the first friend. And then the first friend goes to the ca cafe, buys the burger, eats the burger, burps in front of him, tells him that he has eaten the whole burger without having a kind look on the other person. This is ionic bonding. Transfer of electron or loss of one side and the gain of the other. Yeah, they both can share the money. One one 
a, a dollar each. They can go ahead to the cafe, buy the burger, split it in an exact half, and eat their halves uh, with a very calm nature. This would be a perfect example of covalent bonding, sharing and sharing equally. But since we are humans, we may come up with some funny or some mischievous examples. For example, let's suppose they both agree to uh, share equal money. They both uh, pull in one one dollar. They go to the cafe, they buy the burger. And then when it's the time to cut the burger, one of them is stronger, cuts the burger in a bigger half, eats the bigger half and gives the small half to the other friend with an angry look. And he has to eat that smaller part because he or she knows that if I don't, my friend would uh, certainly suddenly turn into a foe and punch me hard. And instead of getting a punch with a small slice of a burger, the small slice of the burger is a much better option alone. So yeah, that might sound funny, but uh, actually that's true. We act like that because atoms act like that too. This is another kind of bonding or uh, sub-bonding that we'll study in this book. There are many other uh, options. For example, if we're talking about the whole glass, the whole glass pulls in and uh, buys something and the whole glass enjoys the whole thing that we usually do at parties. We call it American system. Everybody pulls in, everybody enjoys. Uh, this is metallic bonding. I've discussed that in previous classes. Or in the, the case of Data pawning, it's more like a donation. You give the dollar to your friend. You never ask for that dollar back. You, you and your friend both presumptively know that this is such a kind of a strong friendship that you're not going to ask one another for money. And one gets the burger and another one gets the happiness of a friendship. The values of friendship which are getting, uh, which are disappearing in this uh, particular time or the times to come after it quite quickly, by the way. So yeah, donations are there, of course. When we talk about donations, this is more like data pawning. The entire thing is donated by one person, all right? So this can be true. There are many other scenarios that we can come up with in the same case, and I keep quoting those because we act like atoms, our atoms, and our atoms act like us. So whichever case you may come up with in this kind of scenario, uh, with two friends and buying something, sharing or losing or gaining or donating or some other scenario like this, you can always relate it to a kind of a bonding or an intermolecular force in chemistry. All right, get the point? Yes. Okay, Laiba is maybe familiar with these examples already and she understands these, but um, uh, you, it may be new for you, Ali, but I hope you get the sense of it, right? Yeah, yeah I get the sense of it. Good, good. So I keep saying that. So when I say that, I actually wanted to make my point. And my point being, sometimes ionic compounds, which are based on loss and gain, may act like covalent compounds and show a sharing character of electrons. Sometimes covalent compounds, would, would, which would be, have been made up from sharing of electrons, may act like that they would try to lose or gain those electrons. We do the same. Sometimes we agree to share, but afterwards we think about loss and gain. Sometimes we go for loss and gain, and then we have a kind moment at heart and we try to share properly. So we act like our atoms and our atoms act like us. So there will be times when you will see that everything matches for an ionic compound. And yeah, they form an ionic compound, but afterwards they be start behaving like covalent compounds. And there will come some times then you, that you will find some covalent compounds and you would notice that they would start like behaving like ionic compounds. Okay, let me tell you, covalent compounds behaving like ionic compounds is something that we're gonna study as a part of AS. Ionic compounds behaving like covalent compounds is something we're gonna study as a part of A2, all right? They have bifurcated both of these behaviors for two separate classes. So let's keep this question for now, since in the later part of, of the same chapter, we are going to study some of it. 
and some of it is something that we're going to keep for A2. Good enough? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right, moving on. So there are some examples, BF3, NH3. This is the same example I talked about earlier. Phosphine, which is BH3 and a hydrogen ion. They can also form a data bond to form the ion pH4 positive. So you can try and draw these with your own hands to get a good practice at data forming. All right. So when you talk about displayed formula that shows all of atoms and all of bondings, uh, bonds, that is good. You should do that. But you don't have to show the correct bond angles in the displayed formula. So if something is drawn like this, or if something is drawn like this, we don't really think that matters for a question. So we correct both of these. Since this one shows the angles, which we are supposed to study a little later in the same chapter. And this one is just, just a general practice we have been doing in IGCSE. So yeah, this is something that I am still supposed to explain in detail a little later in the same chapter. Let's move on. Before we can again come up with something complicated, we need to study a couple of definitions, and those are bond length and bond energy. Let's start with these ones first. In general, double bonds are shorter than single bonds, which means bond length is something which that we can discuss as a characteristic of a bond, and different bonds would have different kind of bond lengths. This is because double bonds have greater quantity of negative charge between the two uh, atomic nuclei. And of course, they would be attracted greater with a greater force of attraction between the electrons and the nuclei, which actually pulls both atoms closer together. So a double bond would be a shorter than a single one, which means in case of a single bond, the two atoms are a little bit further, but in case of a double bond, the same atoms would be a little bit closer, which also tells us that if there is a triple bond, they would be even much closer than the double bond, which is true, All right? More stronger the attractive forces between the two nuclei, shorter would be the bond, which means if we have a single bond, the attractive forces are less, in double bonds, they are more, and they're most in a triple bond. That's why the triple bond is the shortest, shorter is the double bond, and longer would be the single bond. So that's how we characterize the bonds uh, with their bond length and the attractive forces between the nuclei. Now, this results in a stronger bond. We measure the strength of a bond by its bond energy. This is the energy needed to break one mole of given covalent bond in gaseous state. We'll also discuss these in detail in chapter number six. The distance of nucleus from one atom to another depends upon two atoms forming the bond, and the internuclear distance between two covalently bonded atoms is called bond length. So that's how he has exactly described what bond energy is and what bond length is. Let me clarify bond energy a little bit. When I say the word bond energy, we usually describe it as the energy needed to break one mole of a given covalent bond in gaseous state. Why gaseous state? Because the molecules would be far away from one another and would not affect one another by attracting or repelling. So the energy we'll expend to break the bonds would be exact and would not be taken up by breaking some kind of intermolecular forces of attraction or repulsion. That's why the gaseous state. Now let me clarify with an example. A carbon-carbon single bond has a bond energy of 350 kilojoules per mole. This means when this bond is formed, 350 kilojoules per mole of these bonds are this much energy is given away for one mole of these bonds, given out. If the same amount of energy is given back in, the bond would break. So it means it's a cyclic process. Cyclic process means that you can keep repeating the process in a loop. Form the bond, give out the energy, give in the same amount of energy, break the bond. All right? Understandable and easily understandable, right? Yes, sir. Okay. So 
The processes you'd see are different for double bonds. You'll notice that every time we compare a single and a double bond, the bond energy would jump to a higher value for a double bond, which means double bonds are stronger, which means when we form double bonds, they give out more energy. And of course, when we're going to break them, they would require more energy as well, which doesn't just talk about bone energy. We need to compare it with the bone length too. So the single bond is longer in length in nanometers. Remember, nano means 10 raised to power minus 9 meters. All right. So that's a pretty small unit. And for the same double bond, between the same atoms, I mean, it's a much smaller one in length. Carbon-oxygen single bond is longer. Carbon-oxygen double bond is smaller. This also gives you the idea that apart from the definitions of bond length and bond energy, here are the units that we use for them. All right. Now comes the part of reasoning. Why do we study these topics and what do they have to do with bonding? Yeah, they have to do a lot with bonding. Bond strength can influence the reactivity of a compound. The molecules in liquids and gases are in end motion. So they're constantly colliding with one another. A reaction only happens between molecules when a collision occurs with enough energy to break bonds in either or both molecules. And we have discussed it at IGCSE, right? In IGCSE, we discussed about activation energy or the minimum amount of energy that can break the bonds. We never defined it specifically as bond energy, apart from the fact that we discussed some of the bond energies given in data tables to find out a specific bond energy that we require in a specific set of questions or an equation, but we never defined bond energy as to discuss it and its reasoning. This is the first time we are doing that. Nitrogen is unreactive because it has a triple bond. Fairly unreactive would be a much better word. It's not completely unreactive. It takes a lot of energy to break the nitrogen atoms apart. So that's why I will come up with an example. Nitrogen is present in the air all the time. Oxygen is a very reactive gas, which causes rusting, which causes most of the explosions, which causes most of the reactions to go, does not react with nitrogen in the air. It only does that and forms the two NO molecule if there is some lightning around. All right, so lightning, actually, what does lightning do? Lightning gives them the necessary temperature that they require to break the strip of bond and to get it reacted with the oxygen. And you can see this, that's a lot of energy as compared to the previous ones that we have studied. Oxygen is much more reactive. Although it has a double bond, it only takes 496 kilojoules to break a mole of oxygen-oxygen double bonds. That's why oxygen is much more reactive since it's easier to break in comparison to nitrogen, nitrogen-nitrogen triple bonds. However, bond strength is only one factor that influences the reactivity of the molecules. The polarity of the bond, whether the bond is a, a sigma bond, this is the sign for sigma, or a pi bond, this is the sign for a pi, both play a large part in determining chemical reactivity. Now you must be thinking, what is a sigma bond or what is a pi bond? So the sigma bond actually is a single bond, and the pi bond actually tends to represent the double bond. So the double bond is made up of one sigma and one pi bond, which we're going to explain a little later. So this represents the double bond. So it's not just the bond strength or the bond energy that discusses or influences the reactivity of the compound. It's also the type of bond, single or double or triple, sigma or pi. And we're going to discuss that in much more detail in the upcoming pages. Let's go with a few more examples. HCl, HBr, HI. We listed these examples for a purpose, and they have been a, a common part of past paper exams. Why? Every time one of the atoms is same hydrogen, and the other one is a halogen. Discuss these halogens, and you'll notice that slowly 
their bone length increases, but their bone energy decreases. Now, we haven't talked about much about bone length, but if I talk about bone energy, this means this is a stronger bond and this one is a weaker bond. Weaker bond, since it's easier to break and as we require less amount of energy, we'll easily be able to break it. Stronger bond because it releases more energy and will require more energy to break it and to react, get it reacted with something or to form a newer product. Good enough? Yes, sir. Before I talk about bond length, I would like both of you to think a little bit and tell me that why is the bond length increasing from top to bottom in this series? Think about it, come up with some reasons and try telling me those reasons. And you might only need the knowledge from IGCSE. You don't need any A-levels knowledge to talk about this. So any guesses, any answers? The more stronger the force is, the shorter the bond. Uh, actually, let's not relate it to the strength of the bond. Since the strength of the bond is something that we just studied in A levels, try answering the question with everything you know from IGCSE and not from A levels. Mm -hmm. Chlorine is more reactive than iron. Uh, yeah, your fact is true, but here the fact plays a very little part. So I'm not going to consider it as a correct answer. Try thinking about it as, again. You'll be amazed to know the answer that the answer is so simple. So try thinking about simpler things. Ali, would you like to try a little bit? Since I, all I'm asking is something from IGCSE, not from A level. So I think you yeah, can I'm go ahead and make some wild guesses. You were saying? Yeah, I said I'm uh, thinking about it. Good, good. Go ahead. Consider it like this this bond is smaller. And this bond is somewhat larger. Why? Maybe drawing a diagram helps you. Maybe the shells increase. So the a perfectly good answer. OK, this belongs to period number three, which means it has three shells. This belongs to period number five, which means it has five shells. This structure is bigger. That's why this bond is longer. The structure is smaller. That's why the bond is smaller. This is the first and foremost explanation of bond length that you can come up with without even knowing any of the things written over here. You don't know what a sigma bond. You don't know what are pi bonds. You don't know what the polarity of the bond means. You don't know about these words. But what you already know and you can answer in exams for a question like this is that this belongs to period three, it has just three shells. Of course, the structure is going to be smaller with three shells. And this is in period number five. So it means it would have five shells. So the structure would be bigger and hydrogen would be, would be a little bit farther. Right? It was a very easy answer. So before you come up with any advanced, complicated explanation for the stuff that we usually give in front of you as a part of the every page, other page of the book coming up, try thinking about it in terms of IGCSC and in, term, in simpler terms rather than going with advanced information. All right? So I'll keep asking you stuff on the basis of IGCSE-based information before I can come up with a more complicated explanation from an advanced level. So this can be a pretty good answer in exams. And let me tell you, you'll get marks for it. That's why I wanted you to go with some good wild guesses. All right, moving on. Shapes of molecules. 
before I go on with shapes of molecules, uh, I need to consider a few things that I need to tell you apart from the book. Now, what your book is going to do is that your book is going to discuss a little bit of theories from the past that scientists gave up to uh, discuss the shapes of molecules. Your book might just talk about one or two names of theories, but actually it will discuss three to four different theories to tell you about shapes of molecules. Okay, so what I'm going to do is that your book will discuss it in so less detail that it would come difficult for you to understand. What I'm going to do is that I'm going to discuss these theories Whichever, even if the name were just one or two theories, we'll discuss all these three to four theories in a much bigger uh, piece of detail. I will be doing that to make sure that you understand the theories completely so that even when the book discusses them a little bit or past paper discusses them in detail, you will have the idea and you would know how to answer the question, all right? So there would be points that I will be adding to this part of the book that are not a part of the book, all right? So it would be better if you have the book in front of you, if you have a pencil ready, and if you keep writing the stuff over here, or you do it afterwards uh, when you go through the recording. It's entirely up to you. If you want to grab the book in a pencil, I can easily wait. Do that. It would be easier and a much better way to do it. Let me know when I can get started again. Can we start? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Good. The first theory that we're going to discuss in order to discuss the bonding, the molecules, their shapes, uh, how do we get their shapes, is valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. We call it SAPER theory without pronouncing the V. We also call it VESPER theory. Both pronunciations are correct. I'll keep using the word VESPER theory or SAPER theory all the time instead of going with the whole word. Now, before I move on, we are going to talk about valence shells and their electron pairs and the repulsions in between them. Okay, now let's consider a chlorine molecule. Let's consider the valence shell only. You already know that it is from group 17, which means it is going to consist of seven electrons in its outermost shell, right? There is one single electron and then there are three pairs. Remember, all of these pairs are negatively charged and they would have repulsions in between them. The idea of drawing them on top, bottom, right and left comes from the point that they, these electron pairs will repel themselves. So they are maximum further apart because they repel them. We don't draw the electrons like this in a circle around the atom because electrons repel so much that they cannot exist like this. That's why this is a wrong drawing. I was discussing the same point yesterday, but I wasn't quoting the fact that they repel themselves and they cannot be like this. Now I'm quoting the facts. Since this is going to be a part of this theory, this entire theory will be based upon the fact that the electron pairs present in the valence shell repel each other. Let's discuss the theory further. This was just the main and basic point. Because all electrons have the same negative charge, they repel each other when they are close together. So a pair of electrons in the bond surrounding the central atom in a molecule will repel other electron pairs. This repulsion force or repulsion forces the pairs of electrons apart until the repulsive forces are minimized. So we are going to uh, repel them so much so that the repulsive forces would be kept minimized by keeping them as far apart as we can. 
And when we draw a circle, the most far apart points are the 90 degrees angle, like this, as you might have studied in mathematics. Hence, we draw a pair over here, we draw a pair over here, we draw a pair over here, we draw a pair over here. I guess now this makes a lot more sense other than the neatness of the drawing, right? Yes, sir. Now, the shape and the bond angles of equivalently bonded molecules will depend upon two things. The number of pairs of electrons around each atom, these pairs. I'm drawing four pairs consistently, but there may not be four pairs. There may be just three pairs. There may be just two pairs. And the difference between the pairs, whether they are lone pairs or bonding pairs. Remember, we have discussed this before. If I draw the diagram of water, I hope you already know and understand that it's like, and I'm representing the crosses for oxygen and dots for hydrogen. Now this whole lines will make much more sense. The pair of electron bonds surrounding the central atom, now oxygen is the central atom. This is present in center since hydrogens are surrounding it, all right? And the molecule will repel each other. Now, we need to talk about the number of pairs on this one. It has all four pairs. And these pairs are lone or bonding pairs. Two of them are bonding pairs since they are made up of a dot and a cross. And two of them are lone pairs since they are made up both crosses. So how do we define them? Bonding pairs are the pairs of electrons of outermost shell that participate in bonding. Lone pairs are the pairs of electrons that uh, are a part of the outermost shell, but they do not participate in bonding, covalent bonding in specific. I hope you understand after we define them properly, right? Yes, sir. Okay, let's get to the postulates of the theory. This was just the basic idea. Remember, the most important part of the theory would be the postulates, which are going to explain the theory and the good parts about it, since you'll get a grasp of the theory and what the th how the theory benefits you, or chemistry. The valence electron shells are the electrons in the main outer shell. Pair of electrons repel each other since they have the same charge. A lone pair of electrons repel each other more than a bonded pair of electrons. Repulsion between multiple and single bonds is treated as the same as for repulsion between single bonds. Repulsion between pairs of double bonds are greater. Okay, I think the first one is easier to understand, right? I don't think I need to explain the first one, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I don't think I need to explain the second one either. Right? Yes. yes, sir. But I do think I need to explain the third one since third one is something new for you. Lone pair of electrons repel each other. Now this pair, in fact, let me use a different color. This pair and this pair will repel each other more than this pair and this pair. Why is that so? Remember, this pair is being attracted by two nuclei, one nuclei of oxygen, one nuclei of hydrogen. This pair is being attracted by two nuclei, one nuclei of hydrogen, one nuclei of oxygen. But these two pairs are the ones that are only attracted by oxygen and not by hydrogen. So in case of these two pairs, their attractive and repulsive forces may get balanced. But in case of these lone pairs, right, these two, the attractive and repulsive forces may not get balanced and their repulsive forces, which be much more since there are no attractive forces from two different nuclei. I hope you are all on the same page, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good. That's why the lone pairs will repel more than the bond pairs. Let's come to another fact. Multiple and single bonds are treated as same for repulsion, but the multiple bonds will have greater repulsions 
than the single ones. We'll treat them as the same, but the repulsion actually would be greater. Now these two points contradict one another a little bit. When I'll come to these structures, I'll explain this point separately since I might need a separate structure for all three points at the end for this one. So we'll discuss this point a little later when a molecule comes with multiple bonds. The shape of the molecule can be deduced using this theory with the most stable shape being the one which minimizes the forces of propulsion. We are going to consider the shape for a molecule and the most stable shape would be the one which minimizes the forces of propulsion as much as it can. All right, how do you explain point number four? Let's come to an example. Now, they also talk about the water molecule and he is showing you the bond pairs with the straight lines of covalent bonds and these are the lone pairs. You would notice that the lone pairs are covering much greater area than the bond pairs. And he's trying to explain you the same with the help of the diagram. Now this diagram gives you three different kinds of propulsions. A repulsion between a lone pair and a lone pair, two repulsions between a lone pair and a bond pair, and a repulsion between bond pairs. So how do we suggest the point, lone pairs have a more concentrated electron charge cloud than the bond pairs of electrons. Their cloud charges are wider and slightly closer to the nucleus of the central atom since they belong to the central atom only. This results in a different amount of propulsion between two uh, different types of electron pairs. The order of propulsion is that lone pair, lone pair repulsion is maximum lone pair bond pair repulsion becomes moderate and bond pair bond pair repulsion becomes least which means if i have to draw the structure instead of drawing them at all four corners which would be a wrong idea i must draw it like this lone pairs farther from one another as much farther as it can because since they has the most repulsion and then somewhat closer, I'd like to show the bond pair and I'd like to show least repulsion between the two bond pairs. So these are lone pairs and these are bond pairs of this entire system. I hope my drawing is clear enough, right? I have poor drawing skills, so that's probably the best I can do. <laughs> Is this clear enough? Yes, sir. These are actually, these poorly drawn dot and crosses are actually the bond pair. So this repulsion would be the maximum, this would be moderate, and this would be least. All right? Yes, sir. So what we ask our students is to remember this order, this entire order. And we usually write it like this, LP, LP, LP stands for lone pair, has the greatest repulsion. Then LP, BP, BP stands for a bond pair. And the least one would be a BP, BP, since both bond pairs would have least repulsion. Right? Yes, yes sir. Okay, good, good. Now let's work out a few molecules. This was just an example, just one example. We have more points to explain. So we need to work out shapes of different molecules in order to give you an idea. Now, before we do that, let me revise a little bit from IGCSE part. If you remember your IGCSE, we started off covalent bonding with the easiest of examples between the same kind of atoms. I think the first structure we ever explained to you in terms of covalent bonding was hydrogen. Then we probably explained chlorine or bromine or iodine since they were the easiest ones for single bonds. Then we started off with double bond, we explained oxygen. Then we started off with a triple bond, we explained nitrogen. And when we were talking about the molecules that consist of different atoms, the most common ones that we discussed back in IGCSE were 
methane, ammonia, water, HCl, CO2, and the list went on with organic molecules, et ethane, ethene, or ethanol, or um, ethanoic acid, so on and so forth. Do you remember that? Even if you open your IGCSE or O-Levels book, you'll find the same formulas in almost the same order, right? Yes, sir. So that's what we are going to do over here. We won't consider these atoms so much since there are these are the molecules which consider the similar atoms. We'll consider the molecules which are made up of different atoms. So you'll find us doing uh, discussing the same things, methane, ammonia, water, HCl, so on and so forth. We've already explained water as an example to um, make the points or the postulates of this theory clear to you, all right? So let's move on, working out the shapes of molecules. Differences in electron pair repulsion determines the shape and the bond angles in the molecule. And remember, these two things are best described from Vesper theory. These are the two things whenever being a part of the question in past papers, Whisper Theory is the first one that you are going to get back to in order to get your answers. There are many theories. Every theory has a forte. Every theory can explain a couple of things better than all the other theories. The forte of Whisper Theory is the shape of the molecule and the bond angles. Figure 4.16 compares the shape and bond angles of methane, ammonia, and water. Space filling models of these molecules are also shown in the next figure. Each of these molecules have four pairs of electrons surrounding the central atom. Note that the drawing, three-dimensional drawing, the triangular wedge between the bonds coming towards you and the dashed blank line is the bond going away from you. From this, they are going to prove that we are going to discuss the 3D shapes from now on. The two dimensionals are pretty easy and can be explained on a simple board like this. The two dimensionals are easy when we talk about a graph in mathematics, an X, a Y, a negative X, and a negative Y. But when it comes to third dimension, I hope you know we talk about Z and negative Z, right? That is mathematics. That is more of mathematics than it is of chemistry. I hope you understand when I draw Z is actually I'm trying to draw something that comes right to you. And you can feel this effect whenever you go to a 3D cinema. Have you ever watched a movie in a 3D cinema or on a 3D screen? Yes, sir. Yes. There are two additional effects from a normal screen. Things make uh, seem to come to you or things may seem to get away from you. This Z means thing may seem to come to you, right? And this negative Z means that things may seem to go away from you. So what we are going to do is that if there is a central atom, we'll define these bonds, four bonds like this. To show you that the bond is coming towards you, we are going to draw a wedge like this they'll draw a wedge like this, all right? And they are going to use a dashed black line to show you that is going away from you. This is the way we represent the two dimensions and the third dimension as well. That's why we call them 3D structures. We are using the 2D space, but we are trying to explain a 3D structure to you. If you get my point well, well done, that's good. If you don't, get my point, no problem, go to YouTube and watch a video about it. You'll have a much better concept if you watch a YouTube video about it, since they are going to use the actually three-dimensional video to give you the idea, right? <clears throat> okay, so let's go to the drawings, diagrams to give you a better idea. Let's start with methane. This is methane. We usually have been drawing it like this, all right? This diagram was a childish diagram, but even this childish diagram gave you a pretty good idea that the electrons repel each other maximum 
And in order to keep the repulsion minimum, the distance between them is maximum. Right? But now in AS level, you're not going to draw it like this. Yeah, you could have, but in these bonding chapters, we're going to discuss it a little bit more. In a three-dimensional structure, since this is a three-dimensional structure, two of the bonds exist in two dimensions. There is one bond that comes towards you, drawn with a wedge, and then there is a dashed black or a dotted line to represent a bond away from you. And let me tell you, all the repulsions are equal from one another. Remember, these angles are measured in a circle, zero, 90, 180, 270, and we return back to this, this becomes 360 degree. But this is a three-dimensional diagram. The angles are calculated slightly differently, and this is 109.5 degree between all the angles, since they are all away equally from one another to keep the repulsions at a minimum, which were the very basics of this theory. This is the first time you're going with 3D diagrams. So this become a little bit difficult, but what you're supposed to do is to understand the whole three-dimensional idea, understand the idea of electron pairs and how to keep the repulsion minimum by keeping them, all of them, maximum away from one another. And I guess the structure gives all these explanations which I've just told you as the postulates of the theory, right? Yes, sir. Now, this one has four bonding pairs. This one, ammonia, the next structure also has four pairs, but this time there are three bonding pairs and one of them is a lone pair. Now this theory comes into play. Remember, the theory told you that the lone pair bond pair repulsion was greater than the bond pair bond pair repulsion, right? So these repulsions would be less and these repulsions would be greater because of this principle. So lone pair repels them and pushes them further so they become a little bit closer. Instead, these were four pairs, and these pairs were supposed to be equally away from one another. The angle was supposed to be 109.5, but since there was a lone pair involved, it pushed these angles to come down to less than 109.5, and this is 107, point, 107 degrees, all right? And at the same time, it's something that is not written in the book, and I want you to go ahead and write it up that this angle would be greater than 109.5. What is the angle then? Don't predict it. Even if this comes as a question, do the same thing that I've done to explain it to you. Don't quote anything over there. Don't quote 110, don't quote 111, don't quote 112, because you know that's not the angle. But what you know for sure is the angle be greater than 109.5, and why is that so? Because the lone pair bond pair repulsions are much more stronger than the bond pair bond pair repulsions. Claire? Yes, sir. So this angle and this angle are 107, and these two angles are greater than 109.5. Let's come to water. Again, an example with four pairs, but Two of them are lone pairs, and two of them are bonding pairs. So the greatest repulsion would be between the bond pairs. Then there would be some intermediate repulsion between the lone pair and the bond pair. And the least repulsion would be between the bond pairs, which is forced down from 109.5 or from 107 down to 104.5. And of course, this one and this one would be greater values. What are these values? We don't quote these at this level. But definitely they are greater than 
make sense are we clear yes sir. okay i think that's enough for today